So let's have a look at energy, which is a big subject on its own. Um, what we do now is that ultimately for us, all source of energy for us ultimately comes from the sun. So uh, the sun is, uh, what is it, 95 million miles away, so it's a long way away there, and it sends its energy in the form of lights. And the light from here is reconverted back into heat, uh, and then on into different forms of chemical energy, and eventually for us to be able to move and use this energy. So energy is this um, ubiquitous quality which can convert from one form to another. And we can only really measure it when it converts from one form to another. So if it converts from light to heat to chemical energy, at any of those processes, we are able to measure it. And but it's all the same thing. So light and heat are the same thing, chemical energy, etc., or all just conversions of, of, of the sun. So remember what I want you to understand here at this stage is that it's light which is the ultimate source of energy which then converts into other forms. As we can see here, the solar panel is picking it up, converting it then into electricity through semiconductors. Um, now, the most important solar panel for picking this up is the leaf. So the green plants were around long before there was any animal um, uh, kingdom in the world. And the sun's energy is picked up by the green of the substance called chlorophyll. And I always find this very interesting to explain to patients because the chlorophyll is the solar panel for the plant. And as we know, we then go on and eat the plant or the animal eats the plant and we eat the animal and so on. But ultimately, we're eating the energy from the sun there. And the leaf is green. Or it looks green, doesn't it? But the leaf is actually not green. It's not green at all. It's reflecting green. It actually doesn't want green. So it's telling you, I don't need the green. I use the blue and the red end of the spectrum to absorb the sunlight. Okay, and those are the active parts, the components within it. The chlorophyll does not want the green. So when we look at a leaf, it reflects green, so it looks green to us. But the leaf itself would be the complementary color to green, which would be magenta, which would be red and blue. So that's what it's actually using. Its solar panels are on the red and blue. It's absorbing that and not letting you see it. So when we see the green leaf, the green leaf is only green because it doesn't need it. In the same way that my purple top is purple because it's not the color that it's using. It's reflecting that. So if we were to turn out the sun, there would be no color. The color would disappear. There wouldn't be any green leaves or purple shirts. Everything would be black because there'd be no light for it to absorb or reflect. So the world that we see is very interesting because it's only an illusion, isn't it? It's because we've turned the lights on. If we turn the lights off, then everything goes black um, and doesn't have color. So color is an expression of the light. So a blue light, a green light, are just different measurements of energy of the wavelengths of the energy. So sometimes we find that some foods are more energetic for us. You know, some people like foods on the blue end of the spectrum and some on the yellow end and some on the red end of the spectrum because they have different wavelengths of energy. So deficits in energy produce a tiredness or loss of energy, uh, which is one of the major symptoms that people present to all healthcare practitioners is loss of energy. To us, as osteopaths and chiropractors and in physical medicine, pain is a presenting major presenting symptoms. And the third one is actually difficulty in memory recall. So this is a growing one since we first sort of introduced these three symptoms many years ago. Um, this last one is now becoming an increasing problem for more and more people and also for an earlier age. And as we've done seminars on memory recall and how to optimize this, we understand now that everything to do with memory is to do with energy. And if we're not producing energy because the nerves use more energy than anyone else, and that's where we start to see loss of energy is in the nervous system not being able to make the right connections and do the right firing. So difficulty in memory is an experience of loss of energy. So tiredness would be due to loss of energy. Pain is due primarily to oxidative damage, a buildup of free radicals or reactive oxygen species, which occurs because of lack of oxygen in the burner. So the pain is again a symptom of a deficit at the end of the day of loss of energy. 
So these three major symptoms, which is what most of our patients present with, are really the same thing. And so there's a, something that um, combines these all together, which is basically a lack of energy due to a lack of the nutrients to make the energy, or a lack of oxygen. <coughs> now, something which I think we need to emphasize, and I do this all the time with patients, is that 80% of the energy we produce in our body, which is a lot, so we could say 2,000, 3,000 calories, whatever it is that you're taking in and burning, 80% of that goes to keeping us warm. That's a lot, isn't it? When you think about it, only a very small amount of the 20%, we've got 20% left, and only one third of that 20% is involved with uh, muscle contractions. Okay? Most of the rest of it is involved with regulating sodium and potassium pumps. In other words, pumping out sodium when it's gone into the cell and putting potassium back. So this is a pump-like mechanism which uses ATP. Same when calcium enters into the cell, we have to actively pump it back out again, and this takes a third of the 80 of the 20 percent that we've got left. But remember that 80 percent of all of the uh, energy produced in the body is for heat, and with heat goes light. So we actually have a glow, which is of a low luminosity, as well as a heat, and that's why we have the fat on the insulation to keep us warm. So one of the things you know is if you lose your subcutaneous fat, is you start to feel cold because you actually lose heat much quicker. So the middle third is involved with enzymic activity. So of that 20%, uh, a lot of enzymes use ATP, or the energy bond, to donate their phosphate groups or to donate their adenine, ad adenine groups. So uh, quite a lot of energy, ATP, is used to just activate enzymes. And the final third is to use for contractile tissue, in other words, muscles, and non-contractile tissue, such as the cilia. The cilia are little cells in the lungs which are wafting hair-like uh, components up to get a, the mucus up from our lungs all the time. And these work non-stop, all the time. So they use a lot of energy up without any voluntary control on there. So it's only that final third of the 20% which is used for actually producing the energy at the end of the day that we use or call work. So we need... 1,500, 2,000 or so calories recommended for human diet is taken as a combination um, of different food molecules, many of which could be fats and uh, uh, carbohydrates. We see here that the main food that we use here is going to be carbohydrates, particularly glucose, by the time we've digested our starches. And most of the energy um, that we make converts ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, into adenosine triphosphate, which is what I'll try and explain how this occurs. Uh, ATP is used as the energy currency in the body. Um, and some of the chemical energy it contains when split and reacted with water is used for other metabolism. So in other words, the ATP is used for the energy, but we do use some of the ATP for donating phosphate groups in the body and donating adenosine groups. Now it's very important and I learned this from a professor of biochemistry friend of mine, that the ATP that we make in the cell, in the mitochondria, is actually magnesium ATP, and not just ATP. ATP is a substance which is like the universal currency, but the one that we actually, the form that we make in the mitochondria, what we use as the energy bond, is magnesium ATP. And we'll see how that's constructed in a moment. So only a time, yeah, we said that. Okay, so here we are. So here's the three components of ATP. So we have adenine, which is a basic nuclear tide base. We have ribose, which is a sugar. And we have phosphate. And you see on the phosphate group here, we've got one phosphate, two phosphate, three phosphates. So this is why it's called triphosphate, adenosine triphosphate. So this is the nucleotide base with the sugar, it then becomes a nucleoside, and it was called adenosine. So the adenosine is the combination of adenine and ribose. So here, we're looking at the phosphate group, and you'll see bonding the two phosphates on the outside here is magnesium. So magnesium forms like a clip holding the outer phosphate on. And this is uh, very important here, because when the clip releases, of course, the latter phosphate goes off, 
which is then converts this to adenosine diphosphate. So adenosine diphosphate is nothing more than two phosphate groups, in other words, one phosphate group has gone. So adenosine triphosphate is like a battery that's been charged, this is the easy way to remember it, and adenosine diphosphate is like a battery which is discharged, like a rechargeable battery. So we charge discharge hundreds or thousands of times a second. So we don't charge it and then put it away for a week. All right? So this is a, um, a false bit of information that we have a thing called stamina. We don't have stamina. There's no such thing as stamina. We have the ability to produce energy, or not, <laughs> as the case may be. We don't have any reserve at all. Our reserve is our fuel source of a reserve form of fat and things. But the thing is, can we convert that into energy efficiently? So what people say is stamina is really people who can convert energy very efficiently. Uh, when they lack energy, they say, well, you haven't got any stamina. It's because their level of energy is low. Okay? There is no such thing as reserve of energy. We have, if we don't make ATP, and we make a lot of ATP when you calculate that out with the number of cells, um, to the amount of conversions ATP to ADP, and people do these silly calculations, but roughly the amount of ATP that we make in our bodies every day is 45 kilograms. That's a lot of ATP, isn't it? So you can begin to see, oh, magnesium is quite important now, isn't it? And that's all we do is to charge it, discharge it, charge it, discharge it. There's no reserve. If we don't do that charging and discharging, we will live for precisely four seconds. And then you're gone. Okay? The body can't function electrically, chemically in any way without the production of energy. So if you switch the switch off <coughs> and you went into you know, just non-production of energy, you'd have four seconds. Okay? So therefore, there's no such thing as stamina. There's no reserve. Okay? The only thing you've got is whether you can make energy or whether you can't make it, and if you can make it, is how efficiently. And we know in a minute we make it in two ways. Um, this is really interesting. We make it anaerobically, and we can make it aerobically. And aerobically is nine times or more efficient than the anaerobe. So when we're tired and we're working at a very much slower pace, we're tending to work anaerobically. And when we're faster, we work more aerobically. But it's not as easy as a switch going from one to the other. Okay? It's, it can occur in certain tissues where it changes from one to the other. But it's a gradual. You know, there's a certain percentage that you will be producing energy anaerobically. And there's a greater percent, hopefully, aerobically. But if the switch, or if it, the rear stat is more geared towards anaerobic, well, then you will be more tired and making a less efficient energy. So this is what it's all about, is measuring. Does the person need ATP? Yes. Do they weaken to ADP, as we'll see in a minute? Yes, they are tired. Okay. Now, how tired are they depends upon are they working anaerobically or aerobically? Is it the first pathway of making energy or in the second that we've got blockages and problems and deficiencies? And that's what we want to demonstrate how you do this. So understanding energy is something which... If uh, you went to uh, university and college, is you learnt in your first year, I think, um, the dreaded Krebs cycle. And you sort of learnt it to the best of the rote learning that you can do, with the hope that you passed your biochemistry section of your exam, and then shut your book quickly at the end of the year, and never to open it again. And I was like that for... I don't know, 15, well, really until I took up applied kinesiology. And even then, it took me a long time before I dared to open Harper's Biochemistry and even had a look at it and put it back again. It was far too complex, absolutely far too complex. Uh, until I started getting more into the chemistry ideas and developing the functional biochemistry, when we could say that the starter substance, the substrate, was in relative excess to the deficiency if there was a blockage in the enzyme between the two. So then I thought, well, with muscle testing, we can say a person strengthens to the end product, therefore they should weaken to the substrate if there's a relative buildup of it. Okay? And we can open that relative deficiency up by looking at the cofactors and the coenzymes in the pathway. Okay? Therefore, the Krebs cycle could be solvable. 
you know, we could actually unravel uh, the uh, the mystery of the Krebs cycle. And so it was just a matter of buying the, all the necessary substrate products and putting them, making them into a kit and having fun and going through it. But what we of course found at the end of the day is you, it was always magnesium or one of the vitamin Bs <laughs> because we knew what we were looking for because vitamin Bs and the magnesium are the cofactors and coenzymes for, for the Krebs cycle. So we knew that you could cut corners and things, but the Virgos amongst you will like to do what I'm going to do. You don't have to do this as we go through, right? Um, but some of you would always love to do this and you know I don't do it on every patient but I do do it if I think oh there is a problem in the Krebs cycle let's find out exactly where it is you know for a bit of fun but you don't have to do this all right what you want to do is the quick cuts with your patients because of the time factor but I want to be able to teach you a little bit how energy is produced and how we in functional biochemistry can actually pick the pathways apart so understanding the production of energy is easy or it can be as complex as you want, <laughs> and you can make it mighty complex. Uh, so what I want you to imagine is just drawing three lines. One line down, a circle, and a line across. It's as easy as that. One, two, three. Okay, so now what we do is what, what does one, two, and three mean? Number one is glycolysis. This is the conversion of glucose through glycolysis. This is anaerobic. This does not require any energy. And this is in the cytoplasm of the cell. You know, there's that liquidy bit between the cell membrane and the mitochondria, which is the circular part here. So this all occurs outside and produces very little energy, as we see. So it's anaerobic. So this part is anaerobic. Number two is inside the Krebs cycle, inside the mitochondria. It's called the Krebs cycle. Now, this is where we have the sole intention of producing NAD. H and FADH2, which are the components to go into the mitochondrial membrane, where the third pathway called electron transport occurs. So the end product of glucose or glycolysis, the burning of glucose, is pyruvic acid or pyruvate. This is still outside of the mitochondria. So pyruvic acid is the end of it. And this is what we use to measure glycolysis. So it's very simple. If a person strengthens to pyruvate, uh, they need pyruvate. There must be a blockage between glucose coming into the cell and pyruvic acid. That's where the blockage is. If the person strengthens to acetyl-CoA, which is just inside the mitochondria and is converted from pyruvate, they strengthen to acetyl-CoA, but they would weaken to pyruvate. So therefore we know the problem is between those two. If they strengthen to FADH2, or NADH, we know the problem is inside the Krebs cycle here and on into the electron transport. And most of our energy, 95% of our energy, is in this, in this membrane, in between the membranes of the mitochondria, where the conversion of ADP to ATP occurs. Okay? So the simple test, therefore, if a person is you're testing them for energy, is do they strengthen to ATP, do they therefore weaken to ADP? Now, I'll more or less guarantee there's not a person in this room who won't do that. Because everybody's tired to some extent. Okay? Very few people have got 100% energy. Very few people. There are a few, but uh, we don't see them as patients, of course, because we've got no need for them to come. So most of us, when you consider, we may be 95%, but very few people are operating at probably 100%, and don't at some stage test strong for ATP. I gave up actually testing for it for a while because everybody tests for it. But it is the fundamental first thing you should test for because if a person hasn't got energy, they therefore can't work all the other systems in the body. So we devised the eyes into distortion positions of the aerobic challenge of left, right, left, right was usually enough to say that if the person strengthened to that or weakened to it, if you're starting to feel strong and together, they've got an energy problem. And if you pop ATP on them, this will negate. So we know that the aerobic challenge is an indication of ATP. So it's another way of backing up the diagnostic entry. So let's have a look here. So for every one molecule of glucose, that's the simplest form of sugar, 38 molecules of ATP are formed at the end of the day. So this is the system of how it works. Eight ATPs are made in glycolysis, two, and only two in the Krebs cycle, 
because the purpose of the Krebs cycle is not actually to make ATP, and 28 ATP by the electron transport. So most of our energy is produced in electron transport. And in fact, we need two molecules of the ATP to start the glycolysis pathway off. So we remove two from that 28 uh, to, to 38. We take two away because our system needs a prime to be able to get it to go. So in other words, we have to make energy in order to be able to make energy. We have to supply the energy in order to uh, start the process of making energy. The best way to imagine that is I used to have a very busy clinic and I had a couple of receptionists and the overheads in the clinic or the rent, the rates, etc, etc. And I reckoned it out, it, it was probably Wednesday afternoon by the time I broke even. Okay. Thursday and Friday was my money. <laughs> okay. We're the same. We're all the same. Aren't we? we all have expenses. In other words, in order to go to work, we have to work for three days to be able to go to work at the end of the day. And this was really inefficient. And I thought, I've got to stop this because I'm working my guts out without actually making any money until Thursday and Friday. So I'm paying three days worth of my work to go to work to earn nothing. You know, that's bad management, really, isn't it? And this is what happens here. We have to make ATP in order to get the first two pathways of glycolysis to work. They need ATP to sort of prime the pump. So we can use an alternative source to glucose. So we have alternative sources of fuel. Fatty acids, for instance, can be oxidized straight into this part of the energy pathway, into acetyl-CoA. So we store fat as triglycerides in our body fat. We then break those triglycerides down, try means three fatty acids or glycerides, these are saturated fats. We then chop them down by an enzyme called lipase. And lipase, as you know, is made in the pancreas. And not only do we secrete panc pancreatic lipase into the intestine to break fats down, but we actually secrete it into the blood. And this is stimulated by two hormones, which is why it's called hormone-dependent lipase. Okay. The two hormones that do this is thyroxine on the day-to-day -day basis that runs our metabolic rate and adrenaline. If we put adrenaline in there, we burn fat, assuming you've got any adrenals left by this stage and you haven't burned them out, which is why when you're under stress, you either lose weight very quickly or some people gain weight. Okay. It depends on the state of the adrenals. Okay, So if they've got good working adrenals, and they're in a real stress state, they'll lose weight. Fastest way to lose weight. Okay, but the normal day-to-day -day burning and the stimulation of the burning of fat depends upon thyroxine. Okay, so thyroxine regulates, the thyroid regulates the hormone-dependent lipase to burn fat to put it into, through beta-oxidation, into the Krebs cycle as acetyl-CoA. But, as we'll see, it's not thyroxine as T4 that the thyroid makes. It has the activated form of that called T3. So T3 is the biologically active, 10 times more active than T4, uh, which is T4 minus one iodine. So T4 has four iodines to the tyrosine molecule, and T3 has three, but it's 10 times more biologically active. And that conversion occurs in the liver and in the mitochondria of every cell in the body. So if we don't activate that enzyme, you don't activate um, uh, the thyroxine, the hormone, into the activated form, it simply won't work, and our metabolic rate gets slower and slower. And the one thing that does that is an enzyme called deiodinase. In other words, it removes an iodine, and that enzyme is selenium-dependent. Okay, all the books will tell you that. Everybody's in agreement now that that enzyme is selenium-dependent, but it's very difficult to find the right form of selenium that does that. So we have to study and understand how the body uses selenium, and it only uses one type of selenium into making them the components of how the body uses selenium and selenium proteins, and that's a selenium phosphate. So it gets selenium, attaches to the phosphate, and the phosphate is donated by ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So you're caught in this vicious trap that if you don't make enough energy, you don't make enough ATP, you can't then donate the phosphate group, because you're too busy trying to keep it warm, to the selenium to make selenium phosphate to go into selenium proteins. So the whole thing grinds to a, an even more of a halt. 
So selenium here, we see now, is a very important trace mineral, which activates the thyroid, which in the end makes us burn fat and spins the Krebs cycle, as we see. And so many of those symptoms occur, the tiredness, the memory loss, are all symptoms of hypothyroid. And people say, oh, you're short of thyroid hormone or activate. Have some hormone, have some thyroid. And you'll find that the majority of people don't get any better because it's not T4 they need. And in fact, by taking T4, it inhibits the deiodinase enzyme from working. So they actually, sometimes it throws them completely and they get worse by taking T4. When what they are actually is not thyroid deficient, they've got the symptoms of hypothyroidism. They're cold and the hair may be coarse and dry and the blood pressure up and the cholesterol. What they're deficient in is selenium. So this is how we would see the problem and say this person requires obviously selenium in its right form as a supplement. That's what their deficiency is. Not that they're hypothyroid. The hypothyroid is a result of that. But if you're like me, you find there's a growing number of percentage of our patients are on thyroid hormone. It's, it's quite amazing, isn't it? And when you start to test them using the, the hormone markers of T4 and T3, you find it's nearly half the population are hypothyroid, even if they don't have any weight gain. They can be cold, they can have coarse hair, their cholesterol goes up. Why? Because the companies want to sell the drugs. They want to sell you the, the thyroid hormone. They want to sell you the statins to keep the cholesterol down. You know, it's, <laughs> it's pure biochemistry. If you look in Harper's biochemistry, what makes cholesterol? Does anybody know the, obs the, the cause of the substrate is acetyl-CoA here? And if you don't burn acetyl-CoA in the Krebs cycle, you shunt it into making cholesterol. So why? You know, every book will tell you that the symptom of hypothyroidism is high cholesterol, high blood pressure, etc. But none tell you why. <laughs> and it's very simple. Thyroid hormone spins the Krebs cycle and speeds the metabolic rate up. So you burn the substrate of the Krebs cycle called acetyl-CoA. If you don't spin it at the right speed, acetyl-CoA builds up and it shunts into making cholesterol and other triglycerides again. Okay? So, but they don't want to tell you that. Okay, so pyruvate, acetyl-CoA here. So acetyl-CoA is inside the mitochondria. And this is the breakdown of fatty acids that can be oxidized into acetyl-CoA. Now we can also burn amino acids. And most of these are oxidized or transaminated from being their amino acid and then oxidized into the Krebs cycle, or some go in at the point of pyruvic acid. So this is, produces the same number of amount of heat or calories at the end of the day as does the glucose, whereas fatty acids will produce well over twice the amount of calories. So fatty acids are a much better form of fuel providing, of course, you can burn them through this beta-oxidation pathway to the acetyl-CoA. So we can use fatty acids, we can use amino acids. We have roughly, with the glucose in our blood, we have roughly four minutes worth of fuel. At the end of four minutes, we start to break down liver glycogen, which means we have to chop our liver glycogen up into glucose as the source of fuel. Uh, so when we start to exercise, we start to mobilize liver glycogen. And after about 18 minutes, we then start to burn muscle glycogen. So we can burn muscle glycogen while we're exercising aerobically for about an hour. And only at the end of that hour do we then start to burn fat. So the switch will switch. And that switch will switch us into mobilizing fat. Remember, at this stage, we've now got two enzymes, two hormones that do this. This is thyroid hormone, particularly T3, and adrenaline. Now if this switch doesn't work, what will happen if we can't get fatty acids? Our blood sugar level will drop. So cortisol, which is our stress hormone, will flick into action and say, help, we've got a hypoglycemia on our hands, convert protein or amino acids and start popping these in to convert them to glucose to start them the fuel, still in fuel. We don't want to burn proteins, because if we start to burn proteins, where are they coming from? They come from the blood reserve or the amino acid pool, or worse still, if that isn't high enough, it will come from your tissues. And the richest source of the amino acids is your muscle tissue. And the muscle tissue is full of three 
mainly three amino acids called branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And so these will drop down, and when you lose muscle tissue, you lose it. Okay, but it's called sarcopenia. So as we get older, if you don't burn fat here, when you get tired and you run out of your normal source of energy here, you'll start to burn amino acids. And this, in a sense, is a danger of people taking up a lot of exercise when they're older. Well, they start to run and they're going down the gym all the time there. But if they don't burn fat, and particularly if they're quite lean people, they'll start to burn protein, which means they burn their, burn their muscle, they burn themselves away. Because once you get this, called sarcopenia, and you start to lose your muscle, you can't put it back. And experiments have shown uh, in France uh, with mice that if you feed them branch chain amino acids, people don't tend to, or mice don't tend to lose their uh, muscle tissue when they get older. It prevents sarcopenia. But the main one, uh, which is considered to be twice as many uh, much amino acids, is leucine. Leucine, um, you need twice as much, or maybe you say even three times as much, as isoleucine and valine. But we do find that all three of them are necessary, but when you muscle test, it's only one that actually usually strengthens that the person requires to get the balance. So taking three amino acids, the branch chain amino acid, may not strengthen the person, and because they don't need the other ones. Okay, so if you take an amino acid when you don't need it in high amounts, remember, you may be displacing. So it's better to muscle test exactly which amino acid a person needs. And uh, I won't say in the vast majority of people with amino acids, but in a lot of people who show that they need amino acids, it will be one of the branch chain ones. So this is the danger that they're burning amino acids uh, into the pool, into the fuel, rather than burning glucose and fats. Right, so first pathway, glycolysis. Simple, makes pyruvic acid at the end of the day. Every step here, and there's nine steps, nine equations in between. We don't need to look at the in-between substances uh, because what will happen is the person will strengthen to pyruvate if there's a problem here and probably weaken to glucose if they're not being able to burn it up. But we'll know the problem is anaerobic. And the answer is always magnesium, 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 and magnesium, and magnesium, nine times. Because every single one of those pathways is magnesium dependent. So now the next part, task that you have is what type of magnesium, isn't it? Do you use um, uh, a magnesium chloride? Do you use a sulfate? And do you use a phosphate, one of the tissue salts there? Uh, citrate, um, or we do a smart one, which includes uh, um, buckwheat, isn't it, in the, uh, in the magnesium to activate the magnesium, because buckwheat is a rich source of, uh, of magnesium. So you need to test with a few sources of magnesium. Uh, the smart one contains magnesium citrate, um, you know, which is a very <laughs> soluble form of magnesium. Uh, and citrate fits here because it helps actually to run the Krebs cycle. It's an intermediate substance, citric acid in the Krebs cycle, um, citrate or citric acid. Uh, one of the uh, enzyme pathways requires zinc, one requires potassium, and one requires the coenzyme of B3, or niacinamide adenine dinucleotide, but they all require magnesium. So you can begin to see that if you're magnesium deficient, one of the first symptoms that you get is you're not able to produce energy. Okay, or your amount of energy is, is decreased. So tiredness is one of the first things that people get when they're magnesium deficient. Uh, Albert Jeff Bland always states that something like 70% of all enzymes in the body use magnesium as a cofactor. So most enzymes need several cofactors, but 70% of enzymes require magnesium. So you can begin to see magnesium as a really, really important thing. And it needs to be in the body in a right balance with the calcium. So calcium and magnesium are together in tissues like the bone, but they work as opposite as electrolytes in the, in the blood. So magnesium tends to be more intracellular, calcium more extracellular. Now, we convert pyruvate then across the membranes of the mitochondria, which we'll see in more detail later, to acetyl-CoA. And to convert or carry the pyruvate and oxidize this, we need vitamin B1 as thiamine uh, uh, pyrophosphate. We need B2, 
we need B3 coenzyme, we need a substance called alpha lipoic acid, which we met before, and magnesium again. So we need all the Bs here, B1, B2, B3, into acetyl-CoA, which happens to be the active form of B5. So now we need B1, B2, B3, uh, and B B5 to activate pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Then we spin the Krebs cycle, and our end product of the spinning of the Krebs cycle is two molecules of FADH2, which is the coenzyme of vitamin B2, flavian adenine dinucleotide, the reduced form because it's got hydrogen, and eight molecules of NADH, niacinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is the active form of, of coenzyme of B3. Now we see where these, the, the, the reason we spin the Krebs cycle and make this is simply to donate the hydrogens on here into the mitochondria for the last pathway of making energy, which is the electron transport. So to spin the Krebs cycle, we need more B1, B2, B3, B5, alpha lipoic acid, magnesium, and manganese as a trace mineral. So now you can see in the whole process here, really we need B1, B2, B3, B5, uh, magnesium, um, and then a little bit of uh, lipoic acid and manganese here. But you can't go too far wrong we're saying if a person needs energy, think of the vitamin Bs. As we'll see later, the B12 is really important here because the B12 activates the ability to carry oxygen in there. So if you were to take nothing else at the moment for your athlete or your activity patient or yourself, a B complex and magnesium would be the key. Now if you want to be then refine it down, you can say yes, actually Muscle testing shows me that you need B1, or B2, or B3, or B5, or, or magnesium. But as a blockbuster formula, B-complex and magnesium, you can't go too far wrong. People's performance improves dramatically with those two. The last part of making the energy, as we'll see, really depends upon other complexes which make heme, which is formed from hemoglobin, so CoQ10, iron, copper, sulfur, and phosphorus. And of course, the ultimate nutrient at the end of the day is going to be oxygen. So getting the oxygen into the mitochondria is, if you like, the ultimate, nu the ultimate nutrient because it's, we can't do anything without oxygen. So here, with the energy, think bees and think magnesium. So when we put this all together as a laminate chart, which is one of the ones I put together some years ago, and it always is a popular one because people like to look at this for ages. These charts are laminated, they're acetates, um, or rather these are actually sheets of paper inside the laminate. Uh, they're great Christmas presents <laughs> for selective uh, uh, friends and family. You can put your coffee on it and spill it because it's a laminate and not worry about it, whereas if it's a piece of paper, uh, it's ruined there. And they're impressive to show patients. Because patients think then that you understand all this. <laughs> so I have people, and I've done it myself, where you get the laminate and you pop the laminate on the patient, and then you say, mm -hmm. and they don't worry about it at all because they think, oh, and you show them this, and oh, that's complicated, isn't it? I had no idea it was so complicated. And you say, well, this is your fuel, glucose, and it goes through these nine pathways to make pyruvic acid, and all these pathways are magnesium dependent, okay? If, as we'll see, we can't cross the pyruvate into the mitochondria through these membranes here, we shunt it sideways into a thing called lactic acid. And lactic acid builds up, and lactic acid is a very inefficient way of producing energy because we've only produced a few molecules of ATP here. And lactic acid is a sensitizer of the nociceptors. These are the nerve endings which pick up about inflammation. So it doesn't drive at the moment, we don't think, it doesn't drive the inflammatory process, but it causes pain. In other words, it sensitizes the nociceptor and makes it painful. So if you don't metabolize that lactic acid, the pain builds up. So I'm sure you've all sprinted 100 meters and know that you can't really sprint much more than that because you've run out of fuel because you're not going into aerobic capacity. So what is aerobic and what is anaerobic when we run? 
And the general rule that we use, and different people use different ones, but at the end of the day, they more or less come to the same thing, is 180 your pulse rate minus your age. So if you're 50, 130 would be your maximum aerobic pulse. All right, so if you remember how old you are, okay, you did the seminar yesterday, so you can remember, activate the brain. Remember how old you are, take 180, take it from away from 180, that's the left brain activity for today, okay. That is your maximum aerobic pulse. Now, if you're not used to exercising, you only go to 80% of that. And then gradually over the months, you build it up until you get to 100%, okay. So what will happen is if you exercise and you run regularly and things, your distance that you can run in that time factor will be greater. Okay? So you can measure your pulse, but you need to measure your pulse as you're running, because as soon as you stop running, your pulse will drop down, so you won't know what your maximum aerobic pulse is. If you go above your maximum aerobic pulse, you'll be working more anaerobically. This is not sensible for building a good aerobic base, particularly for the heart. So you must keep your exercise pulse rate down. It's better to have it down than up too high. If you're up too high, you'll go into anaerobe, which means you'll produce more lactic acid, which will pump, that, as we'll see later, through the liver in the curry cycle. And this is a really inefficient way of recycling it back to glucose. It can be done, and cyclists are very good at this. You know, when you, when you measure the pulse rate on cyclists, many, pulse rate, many cyclists' pulse rate is 220, 240, when they're going flat out. And they go flat out for hours. But they're not working aerobically, they're working anaerobically. So they're going to burn themselves out, and because they go for lactic acid here, they're burning this as a, as a system of fuel. You cannot go at 240 pulse rate and be working aerobically. You will partly, but the majority of it, of course, will be burning lactic acid. So if we fail to burn lactic acid because you haven't got the right vitamin Bs, you get the buildup of lactic acid, which causes pain. So it sensitizes the nociceptors. And this is what people measure with sports people. So the one thing, you know, when you've got your track eventers and swimming um, uh, uh, people, is they measure the lactic acid buildup at the end of a, a session. So they do a blood test, measure the lactic acid. If the lactic acid is high, it means they're not burning aerobically. They're burning anaerobically, which is not the efficient way of making energy. So at the moment, what we've got is we've got a buildup of pyruvic acid and... Um, here, which is shunting it sideways, if we're not converting the pyruvate or oxidizing costs into acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA here is the substrate for the Krebs cycle. So we spin the Krebs cycle around here. Uh, the end result of the Krebs cycle, the whole purpose of it is to make FADH2 um, and NADH, which donates its hydrogens into the membrane, in, uh, between the two membranes of the mitochondria here. So we know hydrogen is the simplest atom there is. It contains one electron and one proton. Okay, nothing else. We're all happy with that. Okay, so it's either an H plus or an H. An H plus means it hasn't got the electron, isn't it? So an H plus means a proton, a positively charged. Right? So what happens is the H pluses go into the membrane here and build up the concentration, and they eventually get to such a high level that they activate this proton pump on complex 5, as it's called, which converts ADP into ATP. So it's a matter of building up the concentration to activate the enzyme called ATP synthase in complex 5 here. And that's the sole purpose of the hydrogens being produced in the Krebs cycle. It's not the production of ATP. There's a little bit of ATP, but really very little, only two, two uh, molecules. So what happens is the hydrogens have to get into the membrane here. So if we convert the H, NAD, H2, FADH2 and NADH, those hydrogens go into the membrane space here. What happens is we've got an H plus or a proton, and what else have we got there? We've got the dreaded electron, the negative one. Okay, so we've got one proton and one, one electron for each hydrogen that goes in. Okay. Now we're going to pop in two molecules, as we'll see, of NAD or hydrogens from NADH and two hydrogens are from FADH here. That leaves four hydrogens are going to go in all together, which means there's going to be four protons and four electrons, right? Okay. 
because we've got the same number of electrons as protons. So that's all good news for the protons, but what the hell are we going to do with the electrons? <laughs> because if those electrons touch anything, particularly oxygen and other substances, they will damage them. So they're like nuclear reactions. If they touch oxygen, they convert the oxygen immediately into a free radical because they add one or two or three electrons onto that. What we have to do is to carry the electrons along the membrane, the inner membrane, from complex one to two, where there's two coming in, and the substance that does it is called coenzyme Q10, CoQ10. So this carries two electrons from complex one to complex two. From complex two to complex three, we've now got four electrons, because we've got two gone in here, two gone in here. So CoQ10 carries two here, and four here. Now we've got to get four, we've got to get these four electrons then to complex four and then let them out. This is the place where we let them out. So complex three to complex four is carried by the thing called cytochrome C. This is an enzyme which is full of heme. Cytochrome means light, it's a light absorbing enzyme. So this is a substance called heme the same substance that goes on to make hemoglobin, which we're going to look at when we look at about hypoxia. So this carries the four electrons to complex four, which then allows the electrons pssst, out, okay, where there's oxygen. So here's the oxygen says, you can have me. If you put one electron on me, I make superoxide. If you put two electrons on, as we'll see, you make hydrogen peroxide. If you put three electrons on me, I make hydroxyl radical. But if you put four electrons on me, I make water. Ah, oh, clean machine. As long as you put four electrons in every time. Okay? But if you put one electron on, two or three, you make an unstable molecule called a reactive oxygen species. So the whole purpose here is to be able to let the electrons out, keep the proton level high, which will then move along to complex five and allow the production of the ATP. But it's this little bit here which is really the interesting bit because this is where the electrons convert oxygen into water. And you'll always find there's a time, a certain percentage of when we do that, when we don't put all four electrons on in one go, for one reason or another. Could be because we're a little bit deficient, could be because we got damage to these uh, complexes at one, two, and three, that we shove on, this all happens in many thousands of times every second, uh, that it doesn't always go four at a time. Sometimes it goes more univalently, in other words, if you put one electron on two or three, which results in a free radical. In normal oxidative reactions, it's considered it could be up to 5% of all oxidative reactions will produce free radicals or reactive oxygen species. So it's inevitable that you're going to get some waste, if you like, or oxidative damage. And that damage itself of producing superoxide will damage then the membrane here and oxidize it and make it go rancid. It may do destructive effects to the complexes, uh, and it may cause damage to inside the mitochondria itself. And inside this mitochondria, we have a lot of enzymes that spin the Krebs cycle. We've got a lot of enzymes that make up these uh, enzymes and structures in the mitochondria memory. So the mitochondria has its own DNA. It has its own unique structure of DNA to do the repair. It has its own blueprints, so the mitochondria can repair itself. And this DNA, as we'll see after we write, is circular rather than spiral. Okay, the normal DNA in the nucleus of our cell is spiral with our double helix, but in the, in the mitochondria, it's round, exactly the same as a bacteria. So it's a very similar structure to a bacteria. So it has round DNA, and it has quite a number of DNA molecules, mitochondrial DNA, in a mitochondria. You know, some have up to several hundred DNA structures within the mitochondria, and some tissues like the nerves have several thousand mitochondria in every nerve cell. So we now can see there's a lot of mitochondrial DNA, and that DNA encodes for the very enzymes, it has its own RNA, uh, its own DNA and RNA, for the very enzymes of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport. So it's a self-repairing mechanism. But if it blows itself up, which takes a bit of doing, but it can be done, the DNA can repair itself, okay, like all DNA, providing it has an enzyme that can do this. And the enzyme is called DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase means it repairs the DNA 
and instructs the mitochondria to make new mitochondria tissue on there, and that enzyme is zinc dependent. So DNA polymerase is a zinc dependent enzyme, which is one of the major reasons why zinc is so important. 